Thank you for attending Menthols and Racial Capitalism, a history of tobacco profiteering in black urban spaces, hosted by the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center at The Ohio State University, Moritz College of Law. Before we begin, we have just a few notes we'd like to share with you. First, to streamline the appearance of the event today, we suggest that you hide non-video participants. To do that, click on the three dots at the top right corner of any partic participant box that has their video off and click hide non-video participants. Second, we wanna draw attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. Third, please note that auto-generated transcription has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the automated transcription or to hide it, click live transcript in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available on our website and social media channels as soon as possible after the event. Follow us at OSU Law DEPC to stay up to date on our research, programming, and future events. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you enjoy the event. Sarah? Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Brady Siff with the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center, and this is Menthols and Racial Capitalism, a history of tobacco profiteering in black urban spaces. Our guest today is Dr. Keith Waylu, a renowned historian of medicine at Princeton. Before he begins talking about his book, Pushing Cool, um, which I just uh, I pre-ordered and just received in the mail this week from the University of Chicago Press. Um, I would like to say how grateful I am to the leadership and staff of the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Um, Doug Berman and Yana Erdnova enthusiastically supported the idea of putting on this program. And um, Yana, along with Holly Griffin, made it happen as they always do in a way that looks effortless, but actually takes hard work and expertise. So thank you both so very much. I uh, also want to thank my colleague, Shaleen Title, the Ohio State History Department and many others who helped spread the word about today's program. On behalf of the Policy Center and personally, I also want to thank Dr. Amy Fairchild for joining us today as a sounding board. She is Dean of the College of Public Health here at Ohio State, and she too is a historian. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, so uh, she has um, agreed to, and we sincerely appreciate her accepting our invitation to offer some thoughts on Pushing Cool um, from her highly relevant dual perspective. Um, and now to Dr. Waylu. I first encountered Dr. Waylu's work a few years ago when I read Pain of Political History. Um, from my perspective in the subfield of alcohol and drugs history, where the classic literature concerns prohibi prohibitive laws, moral and media crusades, and the policing of so-called addicts and pushers, Dr. Waylu's book on opiates offered entirely new approaches to the history of federal drug control. For example, he wrote about the Reagan administration's efforts to reduce quote unquote entitlements to Medicaid recipients by cutting pain patients from the social security disability rolls. And at the same time, the extreme deregulation and free marketeering that Reagan championed opened the door to Purdue Pharma and their deadly innovations. So where most drug historians had been distracted by Mrs. Reagan's public finger wagging, Dr. Waylu looked deeper to identify and explain a hidden but extraordinarily consequential shift in drug policy. And this finding is only one among a dense and orderly array of findings that comprise his book on opiates. Reading pain or pushing cool is much like opening a well-stocked medicine cabinet. You can clearly see what is inside and nothing is expired. Dr. Whaley's work is not even primarily about drugs though. Before pain, he wrote four multi-award winning monographs on race, health, and politics that cover such complex issues as race-based genetic research, the experience and politics of sickle cell anemia, and social constructions of cancer among racial and ethnic groups. Vaccination, organ donation, natural disasters, and immigration are other topics of public health conversations to which he has made valuable contributions during his remarkable career. It turns out I am not the only one who admires Dr. Waylu's work. This year, he received the Dan David Prize for his contributions to public health. And to illustrate just how prestigious this award is, Dr. Anthony Fauci was the winner in one of the other two prize categories. And this is among many other awards over the years that are literally too numerous for me to mention without running short on time. So I will just say that in particular, with this exceptional work, Dr. Waylu has been saying Black health matters for decades now. Dr. Waylu? Uh, thank you, Professor Sif, for that wonderful introduction. And let me... Um work on sharing my screen. And I will try to just describe the book and uh, in as brief a time as I can so that we can maximize uh, conversation. 
Um, da, 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 da. There we go. Uh, okay, so what I'd like to do is just to describe in the broadest terms uh, the book and its basic argument re regarding how the menthol cigarette became the menthol cigarette. Um, it's a story of business and the creation of markets. It's the story of health and race. Um, and it's, uh, as Professor Sif just said, I am long interested in telling the backstory of disease, health, and society. And the backstory in the history of menthol smoking involves the roles of consultants in psychology, sociology, marketing, in studying society, in shaping markets, and in producing images like this, ideas that menthol is authentically black and therefore cool is not just cool with a K, but cool with a C. Um, the book traces how the menthol cigarette began in obscurity and how it midway through the 20th century, actually in the 1960s, became central to the creation of a black franchise product. Now, I just wanna set the stage because of course, we enter the menthol story this year. And in fact, I'd say for the last six years or so um, with these kinds of questions in mind that the stakes surrounding uh, menthol smoking are quite high. At the uh, tail end of the Obama administration, there were calls by African-American doctors for President Obama, Obama to ban the sale of menthol flavored cigarettes. Again, in November of 2018, uh, surprising to many people, the then FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb under the Trump administration announced that the FDA would ban menthol cigarettes. And then here we are again in October 2021 under the Biden administration, a year in which the president and the FDA announced the banning of the menthol cigarette. Uh, we're, wait, we're still waiting for this story to play out. Uh, the argument for banning in, in the recent stages of the discussion have focused on the long history of flavored cigarettes being used as initiation cigarettes, particularly for youth, alongside the targeting, uh, targeted marketing of menthol brands among Black Americans who disproportionately smoke menthol cigarettes, that is to say, of black smokers, 75 to 85% of people who smoke prefer menthol brands, whereas this is more like 30 or 35% among white smokers. Um, and the other argument for, so the, tar the history of targeting and initiation being key part of the argument for banning. Another key part of the argument for banning hinges on Congress having acted even prior, uh, right at the very beginning of the Obama administration, handing the Food and Drug Administration authority over tobacco for the first time in history, but also Congress banning all characterizing flavor cigarettes, cigarettes that had specific characterizing flavors like strawberry, um, but accepting, exempting menthols. So the argument here is Congress just didn't ban menthols and maybe you should go back because this is a flavored cigarette. The argument against banning um, as articulated often by the industry and its supporters is that menthol is merely a taste preference and therefore not the subject, uh, proper subject for FDA action. And RJR argues that menthol is one of the most widely studied ingredients. And they argue that cigarette smoking is dangerous but menthol doesn't make cigarettes any more dangerous and therefore it should not be regulated differently. As I mentioned, um, in 2009, menthol had its first near-death experience. And to really to understand the, today's regulatory debate, you have to go back to this moment in 2008, 2009, when, uh, when, when Congress came close to banning menthol, but didn't ban menthol cigarettes. When Obama signed uh, the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act in, uh, I think it was June of 2009, all flavored cigarettes were banned, but menthol was exempted. Uh, and it was exempted because of a complicated and in fact troubling concession that was made to a small subset of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, 
we're living right now with the sort of the uncertainties as to whether Congress can act on meaningful legislation and how one or two people can actually determine the fate of legislation. Well, back in 2008 and 2009, the people who could determine the fate of a menthol ban were a small subset of, of of regularly financed um, Congress members at, from the Black Congressional Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus, who found support from the industry and who objected to the menthol ban because they thought of it as discriminatory. Of course, they worked very closely with the industry. And that split within the Congressional Black Caucus was enough to convince Henry Waxman, who really um, who ushered through this really landmark legislation, handing the FDA authority over tobacco. Um, uh, he was unwilling to risk the bill's ultimate passage by making changes in the menthol language. And so menthol escaped a ban. But the responsibility for determining the fate of menthol through this legislation was handed to the FDA. So that sets the story for why it is that the FDA since 2009 has been struggling with the question of banning menthol cigarettes. What I do in this book is tell a longer history of menthol smoking. It's a history that starts really in the 1920s in a time period in which mentholated cigarettes were marketed for their health value as an anesthetic value, particularly for people who were smoking and experiencing what was called smoker's throat and needed a therapeutic break. So menthol came into the market literally as a medicine. Uh, a medicine that could help you during cough and cold season. Um, it benefited menthol smoking in the 1950s. And this is one of the remarkable things about the rise of menthol smoking. It benefited from every health anxiety that defined smoking from the 20s through the 50s. So as cancer became linked to smoking in the 50s, the industry and many smokers began to associate the therapeutic value of menthol uh, with a hedge against cancer. So menthols and filtered cigarettes came, rose in popularity, being perceived as healthier than, quote, regular cigarettes. The pivot to racial marketing happens in the 1960s. And one of the things the book does in chapter three is to explore how, why, and when race becomes important for companies like Brown and Williamson, the maker of Cool, RJR, the makers of Salem and Lorillard that make Newport, and how Black trend setting and crossover aspirations and a particular strain of racial capitalism emerges in the 1960s. Into the 1970s, it tells the stories of how companies understood race and worked hard to build a growing web that would keep menthol smoking in place, particularly in what they regarded as poverty markets or inner city markets or urban markets, particularly important as the tide against smoking was turning and the regulatory forces were banning, for instance, TV and radio ads. This made the urban market even more important. So this is, the, this is one of the hidden stories of the book in, uh, in the sense that growing um, activism against the cigarette in, uh, in, in broader markets helped the industry to prioritize the urban poverty markets that they sought, and then construct images of menthol as particularly Black, as authentically Black. And then in the last chapter, the book looks at the rise of public health activism and local activism against the billboard, against menthol, and where the movement to banning menthol products came from. Uh, I'll say one quick thing before I give you a really rapid fire overview of the book in more detail. Uh, the book, the themes of the book focus therefore on consultants and hidden persuaders. That's a line, that's a phrase taken from a book by Vance Packard in 1957, who wrote about individuals like Ernest Dichter, the founder of a company called the Institute for Motivational Research. It turns out that the industry drew heavily on social scientists to not just study preferences, but to understand marketing and identity in very intimate ways. It also tracks the history of competition between companies, Brown and Williamson, RJR, Philip Morris, and how they understood that the health crises of the 50s and the 60s actually benefited health menthol smoking. It looks closely at how 
markets were made, uh, as well as something that people don't really appreciate in, in, the, in the midst of today's controversies around you know, Black studies, uh, the industry was doing Black studies, gender studies, and urban studies in the commercial world, actually long before these were areas of academic study. So it's benefiting, it's the, 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 the backstory for the rise of menthol is unquestionably things like the Surgeon General's report in the 1960s and studies within the industry of Negroes who would be white and whites who would be Negro. Now, very quickly, I just want to give you a quick overview of what menthol is. It's derived from, a, uh, from the peppermint plant, a, a kind of an oil that can be crystallized from the pe 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 peppermint plant. And we know it because it's interwoven into so many products as something that when taken into the mouth or the throat delivers this cool experience as if your um, mouth has been suddenly um, uh, uh, there's a drop in temperature. It also uh, delivers a sense that your airways have been opened, which is what you get when you bite into a York peppermint patty or, uh, uh, or, or a, a peppermint gum, etc. Uh, early in the 1930s, uh, a Yale physiologist who was asked to study the effects of menthol for Brown and Williamson said that nothing about menthol lowers the temperature or opens the airways, but what happens is it's a perversion of sensation uh, that comes from, that, that is then interwoven with products, and the first menthol product that comes onto the market is actually Ohio-based um, um, in a small town in Ohio, a guy named Spud Hughes um, put menthol in a product uh, and began selling it. And that became ultimately the first uh, marketed menthol called Spud, uh, named after him. So spuds were followed by cool with their promise of therapy. And so the therapeutic deception is actually the first deception in the history of menthol cigarettes at a time when even Listerine uh, was marketing uh, uh, cigarettes for people with smoker's throat who needed a break from con congestion and irritated throats. And so this promise of relieving the smoker's throat is very much interwoven into the early years of the cool uh, promise. The, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cool and menthol smoking benefits from the heightened cancer anxiety. And this is where the cancer scares, as the industry called them, in the 50s and the 1960s was, as one uh, industry analyst said, a psychological factor that no one can evaluate accurately. It changes the type rather than the volume of smoking. And, began, and, and the industry began doing studies of what they regarded as the fickle, anxious smoker that was health anxious and the choices they were making and discovered that one of the choices they were making uh, through the study of psychology done by er Ernest Dichter and others was they were driven by health motivation, style motivation, and aesthetic motivation. Uh, and particularly, uh, menthol was appealing to people susceptible to genuine anxiety, particularly about cancer. So the anxious smoker, rather than the black smoker, was the first growth market for menthol smoking in the 1920s, but certainly in the 1950s. And this is the focal point of um, studies done by companies like Market Planning Corporation that does extensive interviews with individuals. And they begin to identify class differences between Salem smokers, uh, which is the third menthol brand to come on the scene in 1957, and rise quickly and cool smokers, which who are seen as lower income, older and retired, uh, and that all menthol smokers were driven by a kind of health motivation, a desire to find a kind of compromise to evade cancer findings. So as this study says, many cool and Salem smokers try to evade the issue raised by cancer research. In some, Salem smokers faced a dilemma he wants a great deal from his cigarette, <coughs> excuse me, and is not prepared to give up some of the qualities. So 
Menthol cigarettes rise again in the 1950s, led by Salem this time. Um, and this pivots to the third chapter in which we begin to understand how it is that mentholated smoking becomes racialized, particularly in the 1960s, amidst protests over civil rights. The same year of um, the Civil Rights Act is the Surgeon General's report on smoking and national smoking studies as well. And all of these intersect as the industry adapts the menthol as medication theme to new times, contexts, anxieties, and dilemmas. As I mentioned, uh, Ernest Dichter had long been studying status and status anxiety, um, the possibilities of menthol smoking in the youth market, the existence of an older market that was health conscious, and then also what he called a status seeking market. Uh, this is a 1961 study in which he notes that, you know, to understand motivations for smoking, one needs to understand, for instance, uh, that in this country, the Negro market in particular has been a fruitful outlet for many status products. The natural desire to achieve equality in every way possible has prompted the Negro consumer to extensive purchases of all these products, which are seen as being indicative of a raised socioeconomic and cultural level, and filtered cigarettes, he argued, represent such a product. I want to sort of stop for a moment and point out that um, a lot of my research uh, are, is based on sources like the Ernest Dichter papers at the Hagley Museum uh, and Archive uh, in, in um, Maryland, in, in, in Wilmington, but also um, the sources are drawn heavily from uh, the tobacco archives. Uh, as a result of the legal action against the tobacco industry in the late 1990s, in 1998, and the master settlement agreement in which after the state's attorneys general and the Department of Justice sued the industry, it produced uh, through discovery a massive corpus that can now be searched from anyone's computer, uh, mostly because they're scanned at places like uh, UCSF. And this large corpus of over 14 million documents is what allows me to look behind the curtain at the role of social psychology, psychographics, focus groups, polling, interviews, demographic studies, and urban studies uh, conducted by companies like the Psychological Corporation, pollsters like the Harris Company, on topics like ethnic and Negro markets, uh, brand preferences of Negro and white families. And you begin to track how the industry in its internal deliberations became attuned to the pressing questions of the time, health questions in the 20s and 50s, but increasingly in the 1960s, questions like what does the white buyer want? What do Negroes want? What do they, how do they regard each other? And how does that inform uh, their preferences? And how do the anxieties of health intersect with anxieties of race? It's in 1964 that Kuhl begins to see a particular trend. In the spring of 1964, a few months after, uh, really a couple of months after the Surgeon General's report comes out, they begin to see, you know, that Salem is actually the preferred pr uh, product of, of uh, in 1963 and 1964 of Negroes, and I'm using the terms of the time, but it doesn't really dramatically um, differ from the preferences of what they call native whites. 8% of native whites smoke Salem's, 12% of Negroes smoke Salem's in both years. Nothing has really changed. And Cool actually is trailing Salem's, but they begin to see this one small uptick from 3% uh, to 8% in 1964 of, um, of the difference between 3% to 64 of, of African-Americans smoking Cools. And it's this small shift that inspires and catalyzes a movement within, um, within Brown and Williamson to begin to think of cultivating the black market. I should highlight that it's also at a time during which because of increasing concerns about implicit and explicit marketing in college newspapers and in for for um, for youth, for underage youth also, that the industry is being highly criticized for youth-oriented marketing, and as a result, beginning to look at other growth markets. And so it's Cool Cigarettes and Brown and Williamson that moves aggressively in mid-1964 into advertising in Black newspapers. 
and black magazines like Ebony Magazine. And in those magazines, they find willing partners, people like John H. Johnson, the publisher of Ebony, who really was focused on um, a number of things, but also gave the industry a kind of a theory of of African American consumerism in the context of a segregated society to try to understand the African American aspirations and desires. He wrote, for instance, of he spoke of compensatory gratification. Um, he, he, mo he mentioned how patronizing a first class eating establishment in a comfortable manner is not always easy for African Americans confronted with the specter of racial segregation. That outlays of money for country clubs and resorts and similar recreation in most instances is out of the question. But And therefore, he says, Negro Americans who are outside, forced outside the mainstream of American life in so many ways achieve what he called compensatory gratification in ways that often are quite surprising to the rest of America. In some cases, they overconsume; in others, they underconsume. And this is what Brown and Williamson became kind of fascinated by, which is the way in which cool cigarettes could speak to these aspirations, as well as the kind of the frustrations that emerged out of living in a segregated society. And so it's whereas Salem prospects rose after 1953 with the first reported linkages between uh, smoking and lung cancer. That's the green line that shows the rapid rise of Salem. Cool cigarettes began to experience a rise once um, the industry began to cultivate this black urban asp asp aspiring market in the 1960s. And aiding them were interviews focus groups, psychology studies, psychographic uh, accounts of the what they call the man on the street. This is an image on the front of the book, which is actually, it took me a little bit of sleuthing to figure out, it's 1960s Bronzeville, Chicago, uh, which shows on the one hand, uh, the, um, the cool ad, it shows actually a man smoking on the street, and it shows a probably security guard, possibly a police officer as well. And I just want to sort of pause to give you a sense of one of the documents that highlights how it is that another company, Camel, not in Chicago, but this in St. Louis, is attempting to develop a particularly predatory strain of racial capitalism in 1967 St. Louis in order to figure out a way to embed and encourage camel menthol and the production of uh, a black and Negro market. It's a document that is found in the archives and it's produced by one of the consultants for um, the makers of camel, Dancer Fitzgerald Sample. And it summarizes their thoughts on a way to reach the Negro market for camel menthol, specifically uh, what they're doing in black St. Louis. One of the things they do in the mid late 60s is they're tapping into generational tensions that Negroes, they say, don't want what daddy used to smoke or drink that's old fashioned or lower class. Sorry. They also appeal to black pride and re in rejecting white standards, the Negroes no longer look to the white market as its purchasing norms and its purchasing norms to set the standard for what to buy. Uh, again, Negroes are becoming increasingly proud of the fact that they're Negroes and they are now rejecting many of the standards and patterns set by the white community. But this is what makes a document like this particularly both fascinating because of its deep study of the social structure of influence making in black communities, but also really disturbing because a document like this is interested in finding centers of influence in the community, barbers, bellhops, etc. I'll quote, in both Working and social situations, Negroes tend to gravitate to groups, and Negro men usually spend more time with their respective groups than the average white man. Whether it be in bars, club meetings, on the street, or at their job. Within these groups, there are centers of influence, individuals who lead the others because either A, they are more in the know, and or B, they are more forceful. 
these are not leaders in the sense of being pre presidents of the PTA or local civic organizations, but might well be a barber, a numbers man, a bellhop, a bartender, a taxi driver who likes to show how smart he is with his pals or associates. They are sometimes they are established kingfishes. These are the people who are best at spreading the news. They have a strong desire for status and class. And our job is to deliver to them what the company, what Dancer Fitzgerald and Sample called boast material, that is cigarette samples, to these cell groups, thereby imparting prestige and inside inf information. We must impart prestige and factual knowledge in a personalized, almost secret manner, in addition to the product itself. And we must aim this promotional effort at the leaders and communicators within the Negro cell groups. We call this boast material in that it allows them to be in the know and brag to friends about the inside information on a particular product. This gives you a sense of the intimate study of social structure and influence making uh, that's being generated within the industry in the 1960s, not just to embed menthol smoking, but to hold it in place. Uh, the industry also turns to uh, understanding cultural signifiers, music, jazz, they look at study, they, they study cities, uh, they study advertising, and they try to track changing racial ideas about self and other. That is to say, black ideas about themselves and white ideas about black people. So for instance, a study like this uh, deals closely in issues of masculinity and race uh, done by Phil for Philip Morris and tries to explain why the company that made the Marlboro Man so successful in the 1950s is struggling with Marlboro menthol in the urban context. And one of the things that they say is the black cowboy means something to white men. It means escape. Uh, it means uh, many things that it doesn't signify in terms of black masculinity. I won't go into detail, but it, it, the, the intimacy of how they think about race, how they think about masculinity, and how they test their theories uh, by interviewing people on the street to develop and shape marketing uh, ideas so that they study issues of like uh, ideas of social control in the urban setting and how African Americans want to be pictured, what they want to be in control of and why being out on the plains with a cow as a cowboy and a horse doesn't quite that environmental conquering does not work for urban blacks. So the industry studies closely these ideas uh, of race, they study how ideas of race underpin buying behavior. They study um, how they then shape advertising image accordingly, and they track people's attitudes, not necessarily towards race, but towards their advertising. So what's interesting to me is how the politics of race in the industry becomes the politics of how people respond to these widespread images, posters, and billboards that now become part of the urban landscape and fabric. So for instance, by 1976, the, this study in Chicago notes that feelings of racism, particularly anti-Black racism, are more widespread among Chicago white people than in the country generally. And anti-Black feelings are, are also expressed in their dislike for integrated ads or their re rejection of a kind of more opinionated, cool image image like you see on your left. Um, one of the things that happens in the course of the 1970s, and I'll try to wrap up fairly quickly, is the, um, the, the when, as Congress begins to target advertising on the radio and television and announces the plans to uh, engage in a radio and, ad, and TV ad ban, this intensifies the industry's move towards urban targeting uh, with billboards, uh, posters, and advertising efforts. And even here, um, it is, it is, it is uh, laser focused. So for instance, I'll just give you one example of a company in, um, that, that argues that we have to understand not just um, where black people live, but how they travel on transit systems to understand how to market. Uh, 
Um, and one study points out that in Pittsburgh, for instance, black riders travel from where they live into the city, but they travel through white neighborhoods. So while African Americans are the preponderant, the, 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 the predominant group traveling on the bus, you can therefore advertise black themed uh, menthol ads on the bus, but you cannot advertise black themed ads on the outside of the bus because it's traveling through white neighborhoods. And this is the kind of fine grained thinking that they do regarding race and advertising. The last chapters of the book deal with the rise of local activism, public health activism, and the growing attack on this urban billboard phenomenon. Um, one of the heroes of the story, in my view, is uh, a man named Henry McNeil Brown, who went by the name Mandrake in Chicago, and he became notorious for doing something at night, which is to just paint over billboards. Uh, he was an urban vigilante whose actions were emulated in other cities. Um, you also find in the 1980s and 1990s, the industry's defense of menthol, which is aided by an unlikely web of supporters like the executive director of the NAACP, Benjamin Hooks, who argues that the, any attack on billboard marketing in black neighborhoods is itself racist because it suggests that African-Americans can't make decisions for themselves. My book tracks the firestorm around RJR's plan to uh, market a new uh, menthol brand in Philadelphia called Uptown, which uh, produced a backlash that they did not expect, uh, partly from a um, Louis Sullivan, who was the Secretary of Health Human Services under the Bush administration, that ultimately scuttled plans for this um, this particular rollout, but also ultimately led the way towards a kind of uh, the, what ultimately became in the late 1990s as a result of the tobacco lawsuits, a ban. So this is the book that I've described. It's the story, as I said, of the early years of, of a health deception that becomes a calibrated and carefully orchestrated effort to kind of, of what I argue is a, a particular strain of predatory marketing. And it ends um, in 2020 and 2021 with a chapter, a concluding chapter on the long road to I can't breathe. It is a study of urban change, of a particular strain of capitalism, but also of the web that has kept menthol in place, aided by Black media and civil rights organizations. It's the story of the role of the social sciences behind the scenes in making, remaking, and securing menthol markets, uh, leading uh, for long-term smokers to crippling uh, difficulties in breathing. And it ends, as I said, with the long road to I Can't Breathe in a year in which I Can't Breathe became the kind of rallying cry for Black Lives Matter because of police strangulation of George Floyd, Eric Garner, and others, I Can't Breathe, and a year when COVID struck and had disproportionate impacts on uh, African-American mortality, I Can't Breathe, and in which um, over a much longer period of time, you have different forces arrayed against African-American health, which also end in the plea, I can't breathe. And so rather than sort of see, I, I see 19, 2020 and 2021 as a year in which the menthol smoking story, the police uh, violence story and COVID all kind of help to shed light on the production over a short period of time over a long period of time of racial disparities and structured inequalities that disproportionately harm African Americans. So I'll end there because I do think I've gone on yeah, maybe about yeah, 35 minutes or so. And I would be happy to, I'm going to stop sharing my slide. And I'd love to hear your comments, questions, uh, and reactions. Thank you so much. Um, those of you listening who have a question for Dr. Weilu, please do go ahead and submit that. I hope to post some of those in, in just a little bit. Um, but right now I wanna to turn to Dean Fairchild, who also is a historian deeply concerned in her work with contemporary and ongoing public health issues. Um, Dr. Fairchild has written two books, Science at the Borders, Immigra Immigrant Medical Inspection and the Shaping of the Modern Industrial Labor Force, and also, 
Searching Eyes, Privacy, the State, and Disease Surveillance in America. Um, she recently won NEH funding for her current project, which is a social history of fear and panic. Um, she arrived here in Columbus after serving 22 years on the faculty of the Department of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia, where she led initiatives in ethics and public health. And she currently co-directs the WHO's Collaborating Center for Bioethics, um, among other accomplishments and um, achievements over the course of her career. So we've asked her to share her thoughts about Keith's work. And I also want to pose a question about the role of history in policy. That is, what can health policymakers do with the kind of historical knowledge uh, presented in Pushing Cool? Dr. Fairchild? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And, and thank you, Keith. It's a pleasure to, to see you again after many years. and. Um, uh, I just, this is a, a book that is like all of your work is important and, and provocative. And um, Sarah, to answer your question, um, I, you know, I think there's an easy answer and then there's a harder answer. I think the, the easy answer is, is because Dr. Waylu is always, um, always willing to take on hard questions, um, question history, question what we think we know about about how we how we got to particular places, whether it's with menthol or whether it's with 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 cancer or or sickle cell, um, I think one of the easy answers is is that because he unpacks this history that challenges many of the arguments that have protected menthol, why we can't or we shouldn't take it on. I think the easy answer is um, the thing that policymakers should should take from this is that we need to address menthol, which is the single most important significant chemical flavor in the history of tobacco. 52% of, of all youth and 90% of all African Americans initiate on, on menthol products. I think the harder answer is um, this is a moment in time in which we're in this pitched national battle involving my body, my choice. And it's, it's centering around COVID, but that's been part of what's informed a lot of this, this history too. So it would be very easy at this moment in time to look at what needs to happen in public health and focus on say vaccines, targeted interventions and the debate over choice and, and coercion. Um, but the, the, the major work that, that faces public health, and I, I think um, Dr. Waylu's book, Pushing Cool, really helps to underscore this, is that the, the challenge before us has really very little to do with personal choice. It has to do with how opportunities are, are structured differently, depending on where you live. Um, they're shaped by your income, by the color of your skin, by your immigration status, by other dimensions of, of diversity. And so this is a, this is a powerful important addition to um, what is now an impressive literature and how marketing shapes desires and, and shapes consumptions. But I think what he adds here that makes it, um, that, that helps, it's gonna help policymakers uh, address menthol in a new way is this compelling narrative about the perversity of inclusion in this moment in time, post World War II in particular, in which having access to the market, having access to the product, products became an American value. Um, but it's also a history of how this marketing shapes public health disparities by leveraging social crises. And that's really important to understand at a moment in which we are faced with social crises, not only because of, of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but because of the, the ways in which racism as a public health crisis has been, in, been galvanized. Um, and he also underscores how industry gained support from key political and social leaders in the African-American community. And, and, and you didn't talk about this as much today, but the book also goes into the ways in which our approach to regulation um, for the population as a whole also be protects um, menthol. I mean, you, did, you talked about that to some extent, but to me, that's another really revelatory aspect of this book that we can, that we can learn from, from a, from a, from a uh, uh, policymaking lens. So we need to be keenly aware of the potential um, for predation and take the steps that we have long neglected uh, and, and regulate. But um, we need to think too about the role of many actors, the role of regulation in sustaining disparities. If we don't think 
it, it, and so to me, what it says is we have to stop thinking about America when it comes to tobacco as this undifferentiated population, but understand that subpopulations in different urban context and different rural contexts with different access to resources and different environmental exposures need, need also careful attention if we're not going to um, overall have a success story when it comes to tobacco, but then create these narratives within that larger story um, that about the amplification of disparities. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we have some questions submitted by uh, attendees, and I want to um, I want to put one of those out there for Keith. Um, and uh, it's it's kind of the same as my question, which is, um, what is what do we say to the groups, um, the Attorney General of California and ACLU signed a letter, I recall reading, um, said, you know, describing their fears of this being um, enforced against individuals, of a ban being enforced against individuals. And of course, so many examples of that over time. And Dr. Whaley, while you're writing this book, um, I, um, the, Eric, the Eric Garner incident happened. So um, somebody's asked the question, how can, um, how can your message about the history and Dr. Fairchild's um, you know, uh, uh, sort of solution that we think of cigarette markets as differentiated into different um, you know, groups of people, uh, how can how can that message be um, be loud enough uh, for people to hear over the um, uh, the arguments about policing and yeah. or, or how can you address the fears of policing? Yeah. <clears throat> so let me just say that um, I, I take seriously the you know in the age of uh, police chokehold on Eric Garner because he was uh, selling loose cigarettes on the corner in Staten Island. Or the fact that George Floyd was, um, you know, choked to death outside a place that was known for selling the best menthol cigarettes in Minneapolis. These are real serious uh, convergences, and people are, in some ways, well placed to worry about whether <clears throat> a menthol ban will produce um, other such egregious police actions. Because the, the the way they imagine this is, you ban a product, but people continue to use it. They use it in a black market sense, and what and they're policed for doing that, and it produces more such violence. So the way a lot of legislatures have gotten around this is that they've simultaneously banned the product, and they've said, but police are not allowed to engage in that kind of behavior. It's a very simple response, but the the key, so so there are ways around those kinds of fears. The way I understand this, however, is when you look at the long history of how the industry has 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 encouraged their supporters, particularly supporters in the black community, to fight against any ban, this is part of a recurring theme. So, for instance, when the argument for banning um, uh, television banning billboards came along, um, the argument from the NAACP was this is racist because it suggests that Black people can't make decisions for themselves. And that won the day for a while. But then when the city of Baltimore said, look, we have to be concerned about the health of our children. This isn't about Black like you know intelligence. This is about the health of kids. Uh, the Supreme Court agreed with the city of Baltimore. Uh, and when the state's attorneys general said banning billboards is in the name of better, good health for everybody, that argument about it being racist disappeared. Similarly, when the state of New York considered banning indoor smoking, something that we all argue is like, you know, central to good health, um, they, the industry got black civic groups to argue that this was going to be discriminatory against black people. Now, try to figure this out. The reason they argued this is because they argued that like a an executive who had an office by himself might be able to smoke without any punishment, but somebody who worked in the loading dock, let's say, couldn't smoke. So what I'm arguing is that the 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 manufacture of arguments about racism uh, and violations of free choice have been 
elemental. They're always part of how the industry pushes back against uh, bans. Bans on television, bans on radio, bans on billboards, bans on indoor smoking, and now the menthol ban. So if you see that history pattern repeating, you see what is going on here. This isn't really, and the other thing I would say is in the states where menthol smoking has been banned, there is no evidence that it has led to what it is that the industry and others are saying will result. In other words, um, in Massachusetts, uh, in other states, there, there hasn't been the fear of, um, of policing of menthol smoking uh, along these lines. So I guess that's, that's how I'd say is history suggests that these fears are generated and they're often not, um, they, they don't come to pass. Sarah, could, could I... Can I add one thing on top of what he said? I think there's an instructive example that comes from um, sugar taxation, um, which is, I, th I think we can think of in this, the same type of way. So when New York City and New York State, it was really New York State tried to ban, um, put it, tax sugar, and then and then New York City tried to put a, a limit on the, the, the size of sodas that, that some small businesses could sell. You saw some of the same types of arguments. You saw some of you know, the, the, the uh, NAACP came out against it. You had, um, you had uh, um, charges that it was, it was racist, it was discriminatory to focus on, on sugar. And it ultimate, that measure ultimately failed in New York City, but then it, it passed in California. And I think in part because the, the advocates learned from that history in New York City, which was first engage with the, the communities that are gonna be affected, engage with the NAACP, engage with local African-American leaders, local leaders of, of color to, to create a coalition that's supportive of it before you then move forward with, with a measure. But certainly um, there's a, if thinking about the timing of and and the, the degree to which you include the broader community and the and the kinds of step regulatory steps you want to take is important. Can can I add one other thing to this, which is that you know the times also change. So I didn't point out that um, the people who were part of uh, warning that uh, that we needed not to ban the menthol cigarette in two thousand nine, like the NAACP, they've changed their tune. They, they no longer believe that the ban of the menthol cigarette would be detrimental to African-Americans. They think that it would be advantageous to African-American health in the short and the long term. So 2009 is not the same as 2021. Uh, Jim Clyburn um, uh, from South Carolina, who was part of a constituency of African-American legislators who were skeptical about a menthol ban in 2009, has also changed his tune. Uh, and many of the elected representatives who were part of that um, time period are retired and they're gone. And they're replaced by others who have a very different perspective on uh, the menthol cigarette. So the times change and the, the politics of race and menthol has certainly changed, which is why I think that we're in a completely different moment in 2021 than we were in 2008 and 2009. Great, thank, thank you both. Um, okay, so I'm just, I'm gonna read this, this question verbatim. Um, in light of the congressional roadblocks due to campaign financing and regulatory roadblocks through agency politics or regulatory capture, how best can advocates continue to push for meaningful change to address the inequities and disparities um, that you discuss in your book? Um, so I think um, Dr. Fairchild mentioned coalition building. Um, and um, we've talked a little bit about messaging. Uh, do either of you have anything to add? What strategies should people be thinking about? Um, well, the thing that I um, articulate in the book that I think adds something new to the current discussion is to understand that the menthol cigarette is itself has built a market based on not just kind of racial deceptions, but a health deception, um, an, a health argument that goes way back uh, 100 years that 
it is that is that is safer and better and healthier to smoke menthol cigarettes, that it has a therapeutic medicinal benefit, and how central this argument has been for a hundred years in creating menthol, and that it became implicit, but it, but the industry in its internal documents continued to track how it is that smokers brought to menthols these associations of better health. And because now this is a, a food and, you know, 2009 changed things because the Food and Drug Administration is responsible for regulating products that are supposed to speak to our health. And the, the history of, of, of saying that something is healthier when it's not <laughs> and building a market around those claims, I think ought to play a role in the determination of what kind of deception, what kind of messaging. Um, and, and so I guess th that's what I'd say. You, you asked about um, you know, how we can method. I, I'm actually just watching the FDA now. They're going through the motions and they will be de making a determination. So I actually think that you know, the, 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 um, the momentum is, uh, leads me to think that the fourth time may in fact be the charm, that menthol may not have another near-death experience. Um, I also want to point out one thing that Philip Gardner, who is uh, on the call here in the audience, who's uh, somebody who's been devoted uh, as a public health expert to writing about the history of menthol and the Africanization, African-Americanization of menthol smoking for longer than I have, wrote, uh, clarified that the ordinances uh, currently target retail establishments, not individuals. And that's an answer to the question of why it is that you know the, the, the manufacture of the fear that people will be assaulted for smoking menthol cigarettes if they're banned is misguided. So I think that that's worth kind of highlighting. Thank you, Philip. Okay, so um, we also sort of have a line of questions here um, about the, the, the wants to talk about the legal versus illegal drug markets. And should, should we be thinking about the possibility of an illegal market in menthols um, becoming a problem. Um, and, uh, you know, along those lines, what makes, why is, why has menthol been given this extension? I mean, it's that, um, why not for bubble gum? <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I think this, uh, as part of this, maybe you can talk about like, the nature of menthol, like um, it's, you call it deceptive and it's a plant alkaloid, like so many of our psychoactive drugs, illegal and legal are plant alkaloids. Um, so maybe there's something about the nature of it um, that is, um, that can give some insight here too. So that's kind of a multi-part question for you, Dr. Wailu. Yeah. So the question really is, um, it, it, the, art, the industry does make this argument, why single out menthol cigarettes when menthol doesn't make cigarettes any more dangerous? Uh, the argument, uh, as uh, Dean Fairchild pointed out, is, you know, menthol is uh, the quintessential initiator smoke. Um, that is, and, and if one wants to stop in the smoke, the initiation of smoking, you ban flavored cigarettes because we've always known, and, and Congress did that. The, the fact that they um, did the exempted menthol smoking is a byproduct of a very specific kind of political um, uh, horse trading in 2008, but they handed responsibility to to FDA that made multiple decisions to ban it, um, fought by industry. Menthol is uh, a mask as well. Uh, and this is a story not of menthol married to chewing gum or menthol married to candy or menthol married to food products. This is a, a story of menthol married to a cigarette um, that, that is unquestionably, according to those who produce cigarettes, um, a, a, a major health hazard um, that causes uh, heart disease, cancer, and is responsible. It's it's like the single most preventable. It, it's a devastating product that produces the single most preventable kind of range of, of, of illnesses and mortality in our country, uh, arguably in the world. 
<laughs> so, I mean, maybe I, I, I don't know the data on all of that, but so this is not just like adding menthol to any other product. Um, it's a mask and it's, uh, it's something that is used to initiate and also deceptive because it is sold as a product that opens the airways and enhances breathing and relieves and soothes when in fact it does no such thing. Okay, thank you. Um, and for for either of you, um, I want to I want to follow up on this difference between food and drugs because um, for a long time the FDA, of course, didn't um, wasn't able to regulate uh, tobacco at all because it wasn't considered a drug. And yet, um, menthol has these very specific qualities of a drug. On the other hand, so many foods that people eat are also very unhealthy and cause public health problems. So I think there's a difference between people who eat and people who smoke too. And there's this sense sort of from, um, you know, people who study the drug wars um, are, are sort of beginning to think, you know, it's, these are wars on people who do particular things and have particular habits. So I guess I'm just, I, I'm just generally asking, like, why does food seem to get such a pass and does it have something to do with smoking versus eating and that behavior that goes sort of beyond or deeper than the the health aspects themselves of of a, a particular food or something one might smoke Heath, i could take a first crack mm -hmm. at it if, you, mm -hmm. if you like um so sarah that's a great question and you know there are a lot of things that get a pass um, sugar gets a pass fast food gets a pass alcohol get to pass. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we know that it's poor communities, communities of color that are most saturated with advertising for all of these products and exposures for all of these products. They're, they are concentrated in, in particular neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, but your question was, what's why? And I think a large part of the answer is the way in which this in this country that we frame health. We frame it as the responsibility of the individual, uh, of bad choices, not bad structures, not deceptive marketing, not predatory marketing. Um, uh, and that's, that's the way that we've come to think about these issues, particularly since the 1970s. And as, as Keith pointed out, menthol is particularly insidious because it was explicitly marketed as a good choice, a healthy choice, a safe, a safe choice. Um, but I think the other thing we have to ask too is what makes tobacco different? Um, um, and earlier I used the word exposure um, to describe not only tobacco, but, but sugar, food, alcohol. And, and I think one of the reasons that we have made progress on tobacco, even though we're talking about the lack of progress when it comes to the, the menthol as a chemical flavor, is that we have seen it, we have, see, we have seen it, we have framed it not only as a choice, but as, as an exposure, an exposure to carcinogens that the industry hid evidence of for years, um, as exposure to, to, to bystanders through, through side stream folks, particularly, particularly children. Um, and so what I think we need to do, and it's one of the things that I've tried to do in the case of sugar-sweetened beverages, is begin to think about the, the lessons of tobacco and, and shift that frame by understanding sugar, fat, alcohol, what have you, in the same way that we think of, of tobacco as an exposure, as an, an environmental exposure. When we have environments that are saturated with unhealthy products, when he unhealthy products get uh, harder and uh, when healthy products are harder to get and are more expensive, um, we can begin to think of this moment as, as a moment analogous to the early years of the, the last century. Um, it's kind of like swill milk or polluted water. Um, it's there, we can't avoid it. And, um, and we, need to, we need to reframe all of this in terms of thinking about, about it in terms of exposure, which is gonna be harder for some of these other products, but I think it's still, a, 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 it's part of what's the, the success in terms of tobacco, I think that we can learn from when we move to other areas. Yes, let me just say maybe three quick things uh, about your question. Um, what, what I think people don't fully understand about tobacco um, and tobacco products is that 
they have not been regulated. Uh, they have they the industry has really successfully for most of the 20th century and into the 21st century evaded uh, either being classified as food or drug. <laughs> and I don't know any other industry that has managed to pull that off uh, for so long, <laughs> S such that it, it's in our lifetimes, it's within the last 12 years that we finally said tobacco <laughs> should fall under the, the jurisdiction of the Food and Drug Administration. So the thing that has been exempt over the course of our history is it, it's not like we're singling out menthol or it's that it's that tobacco has been exempt from any kind of oversight they've been not they've been exempt they've not been exempt from like uh you know F federal trade commission or fcc rules right you know you can't like market deceptively and so in the 1940s when when they began to really push too explicitly the idea that menthol was therapeutic they got slapped down for that but they never really had fda so in in, in fact we're dealing with 12 years now of a kind of a pent up history like what do we do about tobacco right that's this is a new world for us because of the complete absence of any kind of fda oversight the second point i want to make is um that that you know we we do have products or ingredients like saccharin that have been banned right i mean there are periods of time during when during which you look closely at food and food ingredients and you say this ingredient ought not to be in food and there's a robust debate about it. And guess what? We don't have saccharin in food anymore because there are a set of health associations that we health problems that we just want to avoid. Um, that's the world in which we're in. And then the last thing I'd say is the industry has been very good at doing a kind of politics of distraction um, that I um, that I sometimes hear. And that is why single out the menthol cigarette when there's so much else that we could be like, why not air pollution? Why not foods? Why not alcohol? Why not? And that is another move that is often made, right? Alongside the racial targeting move is to say, look over there, right? You know, don't pick on us. In fact, when Uptown Cigarettes, uh, when RJR announced Uptown Cigarettes and in the Black community in Philadelphia in 1989, 1990, and said, we're going after Black people because if Nike can do it, we can do it too. And 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 Louis Sullivan, the HHS secretary, came out and said, this is slick and sinister and needs to stop. Their first reaction was, one, why? This is the first time that a human services secretary is singling out a brand why are you doing this? Why don't you pick on these companies and those companies? And Sullivan said, I'm picking on you because you're doing something where you're saying we are marketing to Blacks specifically. And it really worked, the criticism, to end the campaign. So there, but the, the point is that this is a political argument and often the political argument involves trying to shift the debate elsewhere to racism or to, well, look at these other culprits. Well, um, that's a great, actually a great segue to my next question. We have a couple of people who want to know, who, who have expre expressed interest in um, Black resistance to marketing campaigns and um, sort of want to know more about that. Um, do you have anything, I, I know you couldn't <laughs> include everything in your presentation. Um, what, are there any uh, sort of, um, Top stories that you would share, that you would share about the effectiveness of that, or could, or could otherwise. You say the first part of your question again. Um, well, the um, people are a couple of people have said they're interested in resistance um, mm -hmm. by black community leaders to right. these overtures, to the marketing right. overtures, to the shifts in advertising. Um, so, uh, so there are that a number sort of, of struck a chord with with some of our attendees for sure. Yeah. So there are a number of features that I would point to, um, and and the kinds of resistance fall along multiple lines. 
So, uh, and, and they, they would start, I would say, with in 1960s, as Cool is pushing aggressively into Black newspapers, there are what you might call rumors that begin to spread, kind of conspiracy theories, um, un, unsupported theories that say things like, well, this is part of a, the tobacco industry's conspiracy to kill black, white, black people. And, and there are conspiracies that say that the K in cool is for KKK. And the industry notices this and pushes back aggressively very early in the black newspapers and says, there's nothing to this. In fact, we support the black industry. So you get this sort of skepticism that bubbles up in all kinds of ways. In the 80s, you get the Henry McNeil Brown approach, which is to kind of surreptitiously push back against uh, the billboards by whitewashing or blackwashing them. That's picked up in Dallas, it's picked up in Philadelphia, it's picked up in New York. Um, and the industry is concerned about it because they see this as uh, infringement on free speech rights, uh, infringement on their right to advertise. Um, you get pushback also in the newspapers and then the pushback comes from actually public health folks. Uh, the medical world and the public health folks really become kind of you know, single-minded, not single-mindedly, but there's a consensus that grows in public health and medicine that cigarettes and tobacco products are hazardous to health. And so what you begin to see is an increasingly vocal public health activism uh, married to local activism from ministers and others in the 1970s, certainly, but increasingly in the 1980s and in the 1990s. Um, so activism takes a number, number of different forms. And then you begin to see the critique of, of African-American groups, aimed at African-American groups who have taken support from the industry. Uh, which, which is a debate that happens within the Black community. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. There's, um, well, well, anyway, the book is filled with examples like this where you begin to see uh, criticism. And then the last thing I would say is when the state of California um, passes a, a bill that actually takes tobacco, uh, cigarette um, uh, taxes to fund anti-cigarette measures, you start to see the way in which um, the state becomes part of the support of uh, anti-smoking or pro-public health uh, measures. So it it the, the 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 activism grows and expands such that we're now talking about you know local bans like San Jose has banned the sale of menthols. Um, multiple hundreds of cities have done this. Numerous states have done it, and we are so the the forces have kind of swung in the direction that are uh, that's really driven in large part by local and regional and state and then also national activism. Okay, thank you. Well, um, we are left with uh, with three minutes remaining. And um, I just want to say that this seems to me that, uh, like the start of a conversation rather <laughs> rather than the end of one. So um, so thank you so much, Dr. Weilu, for sharing um, this overview of your book today. I guess I would just want to recommend um, the book to anybody who uh, is even a little interested in this. It's very um, it's very readable. Uh, and I want to ask Dr. Fairchild, do you have any? Um, is there any or either of you? Is there anything that uh, that you want to make sure you fit into our our time here before we sign off. Uh, I, Sarah, I'm just going to reiterate your 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 call to read Keith's book. Uh, it's a it's a fascinating history of 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 marketing of public health, and it's one of the most complex books that I've read on the history of of tobacco, and I think certainly one of the most most important. Thank you. Thanks. And, and I would say thank you both uh, for the wonderful conversation and those who attended for their questions. Um, you know, in a way, what I would like to say is the book, it, it pulls back a curtain that we often don't see with other industries. We've talked about, you know, sugar, we've talked about, and one of the things that we benefit from with regard to the um, to the, the master settlement agreement and the lawsuits against industry by state attorney generals in the 1990s is the 
the trove of material so that we can actually begin to see how a product pivots from health marketing or youth marketing to racial or gender marketing and to pull back and to see that the extraordinary amount of players that are that that are necessary to not just to make that work but to sustain the push and to um, and to kind of maintain the hold of a product in a community. And so, whereas many would say, well, this is just a matter of individual choice, that is the pull, right? Like my love of menthol is what's driving this. And then when you pull back the curtain, you see the enormous amount of work it takes to sustain a set of smoking preferences. And that's really what the book has tried to do. Um, yeah, and I added a link into the chat to the Stanford collection, which is really phenomenal. It's um, it's you're pulling back. The, they're pulling back the curtain on a lot. Um, and in particular, if you're interested in how uh, cigarettes have been marketed to women. Wow. You can really get um, an eyeful um, there uh, by uh, looking through the um, the digitized files. OK, well, um, I think uh, we can wrap up with that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, both of you, Dr. Fairchild, Dr. Weilu and all of our attendees. Thanks for sharing your lunch hour with us. and. Um, and we really appreciate it. Thank you.